Although Dürer was a brilliant painter, his prints were masterful and were a major part of his achievement and success. You'll see quoted from the textbook, on his return to Nuremberg, Dürer began to publish his own prints to bolster his income, and ultimately it was the prints, not paintings, that made his fortune. It was printmaking that gave him money and also a degree of independence as an artist. So you'll remember that printmaking developed first in the north in the 15th century, right? And Nuremberg was where we saw the first illustrated books, the Nuremberg Chronicles. So Dürer actually trains in Nuremberg with the artists who worked on this publication and other major Bibles and prints. Dürer was a master at both woodblock printing and engraving. In fact, if you see this is a woodblock, you can see that compared to the, the woodblock that we saw in the 15th century, Durer has really refined the technique so that it is so detailed and precise, it almost looks like an engraving. And then Durer's engravings are simply amazing. And so you see that, for instance, in this print, this engraving of Adam and Eve, incredible subtlety, detail, precision, lifelike realism. And of course, this also shows us the Italian influence, the Italian ideas that he picked up when he was in Italy. Now, I'm not literally saying that he copied the Sistine ceiling since it wasn't painted yet, but I am suggesting that he starts to get interested in a anatomically defined body that has the musculature and the nudity that are associated with the Italians interested in classicizing naked bodies, the, the heroic nude. So that's a, a real connection. On the other hand, you can very much see how Durer, despite the nude bodies, is so much a northern artist, right? That we have some features that demonstrate Durer's engagement with Italian humanism, but we have others that really show us that it's more northern than Italian. So engraving is one, since it's very much developed in the north, but also this level of precision. The muscles, that kind of precision of anatomy we saw in Italy, but the kind of detail of the bark, so that you could actually define this as a birch tree, or the fur on the cat, or the curls, and the kind of subtle details in the background, that's very northern. The writing on the panel, a northern trick that artists like Durer and Van Eyck love to do. Now, this particular artwork is also very northern in that it's filled with what we would call disguised symbolism. So we have Adam and Eve, they represent sin and punishment. Well, that's not so disguised, but there's a little mouse down here that actually is a symbol of Satan. And these animals that are hanging around Adam and Eve, they actually are very specific symbols of what were called the four humors, which are which were th the theory of the time was that certain humors, which means fluids in the bodies, that's what they mean by humors, not being funny, certain fluids in the bodies produced illness. And so this is actually a kind of symbolism of the illnesses that were imagined to be the main illnesses that beset human beings at the time. So the elk here hiding in the shadows represents melancholy, what we would today call depression. That's why the elk is hiding in the shadows of the trees. The elk is too depressed to come out. But this is also associated with the... Um, the negative emotions of despair and greed. And then you've got a cat. And you might be a cat person, I am too, but this is supposed to be a nasty cat. <laughs> this is supposed to be one of those mean cats that hisses because this represents the humor, the bodily flu fluid, yellow bile, that was thought to produce anger and pride. So the cat is supposed to kind of embody that. And then you have over here 
seated in kind of a lazy way, the ox, because the, the bodily fluid phlegm was said to be what produces laziness. And then we've got our rabbit over here. And to this day, rabbits are associated with being lusty, being hot-blooded and oversexed. That bodily fluid is associated with blood. So the idea is, oh, if you're too sexed up, you've got too much blood. And so you would need a treatment like perhaps having leeches suck out a little of your blood so that you would just calm down. In terms of the artistic tradition, this is very much like the kind of symbolism that you learned about where the dog is associated with fidelity, where you looked at details to find symbolic meaning. And you also saw that in the 15th century North in the religious context where the vessel, the copper pot represents the, the Virgin Mary as the vessel of God, right? All of these sort of ordinary objects that have a layer of meaning. This is Durer being very Northern in conceiving a print that he was able to sell independently. So this is a key idea of Durer as an entrepreneurial artist. And that's why I'm comparing him to Martin Schongauer, because he was our first example of an artist who could invent a fascinating and complicated and interesting composition and sell them on speculation. Meaning he's not like Michelangelo working on the orders of Pope Julius. Michelangelo was painting a site-specific artwork that Pope Julius wants in a certain place. This is a free floating sheet of paper that Durer can actually produce in large quantities because it's the reproducible medium of engraving. And if he makes it really interesting and rich to look at, he can sell it in large quantities and make money and have a measure of freedom, which is what happens for Durer. He gets tremendously successful because he's so skillful, but he's also so smart about how to turn engravings into a money-making proposition where he can sell them on an open market.